Robert Holmes is quite easily one of the greatest writers in the history of Doctor Who. Over 18 years he wrote some of the best stories in the show's history and is very influential in making the show this great success that it is to this day. In this video I'm going to look at the story behind his time on the show and the amazing legacy that he left behind. Born in Hertfordshire in 1926, Robert Holmes enlisted in the British Army at the age of 18 to fight in World War II. By the end of the war he was the youngest serving officer in the British Army. Soon after the war he joined the police force and it was during this time that he discovered his passion for writing as he liked watching journalists scribbling down stories during court proceedings. He learned shorthand and soon after resigned from the police force pursuing a career in journalism writing for local newspapers. It was in the late 1950s that he started writing for TV, including stories for TV shows such as No Hiding Place and The Saint, but most notably he wrote several stories for medical dramas Emergency War 10 and Dr Finley's Casebook. In 1966 he made his big break by writing a low budget sci-fi film called Invasion. In the early 60s he wrote an independent serial called The Space Trap, however the response he got from the BBC was that they weren't looking for that sort of thing at that time. He did then later adapt it for Doctor Who and approach the then script editor Donald Tosh with it. He got a much more favourable response from Tosh, but soon after Donald Tosh left his role as script editor and Holmes's script was then forgotten about. That was until during season 6, when, well, let's just say they sort of messed up a bit in the script front. The Dominators got cut down from six episodes to five due to complications around it being a bad story. And then the script The Queen of Time fell through and its replacement Prisoners in Space also fell through. This led to script editor at the time Terence Dix approaching Robert Holmes's script and developed it alongside him, making a four part story to fill this six part space. This meant that the previous story, The Invasion, had to be moved from six episodes to eight which, frankly, given how great the invasion is, was a very good move. The Space Trap then became the Crotons and was Robert Holmes' first contribution to the show. And it's, well, passable. The Crotons is a decent story, but it's nothing spectacular. It just sort of is there, but you can see some of Holmes' later elements in it. It has class divide in it amongst the local people and the Crotons, and to be accepted to a higher level of the civilization, you have to pass a test. This basically being satire of O-level exams. But despite the Crotons not being the most popular story, it was good enough that then later on when another script in season 6 fell through, Terence Dix again approached Robert Holmes to fill this space, this time producing a six-part story and his second contribution to Doctor Who, The Space Pirates. Yeah, to be fair to The Space Pirates, it is missing five of its six episodes, and the one episode that does survive is a bit of a filler episode, as the main TARDIS team are basically on holiday during it. The story is quite let down by the fact that there's so little visual material surviving of it, especially given that a lot of it is based around these big effects sequences. It is quite no, well known as being a very boring story and is down in the worst of classic Who amongst the likes of The Twin Dilemma and The Gunfighters. For the first two scripts for Robert Holmes to produce for the show, it wasn't really looking like he was the show's best writer. However, he did get along well with Terence Dix, who, who had a lot of faith in him, and decided to give Holmes a big responsibility of writing a story that would introduce audiences to the Third Doctor. Holmes produced a four-part serial, Spearhead from Space, which not only had to introduce the Third Doctor, but also had to introduce new companion Liz Shaw, and brought the Doctor down to Earth in his exile period. But Spearhead from Space is known as one of the all-time greats of Doctor Who, and it introduced the villains of the Autons and the Nesting Consciousness, which over 40 years later would be the villain that Russell T Davis would choose to use to reintroduce 21st century audiences to Doctor Who. It goes without saying that this was a very popular story, and also included some of Robert Holmes's political commentary that the coming seasons of Doctor Who would become known for. Keep staff down for a minute. Hey, Dave, don't get machines going on strike, eh? He was asked to write the opening story for the next series, Terror of the Autons, again bringing back the Autons. With this story, he again had to introduce companion Joe Grant to the show, played by the wonderful Katie Manning, as well as introduce the new villain of The Master. 
Described by Barry Letts as being the Moriarty to the Doctor Sherlock Holmes, the Master would return for all the stories throughout this season and would continue to be the Doctor's main nemesis throughout the show to this day. Terror of the Autons is a good story. It's not as great as Spearhead from Space, but it is certainly still a pretty solid story. Though at this point, problems that would become bigger in later years started to emerge. The story was complained about for being violent and scary for kids, particularly a children's doll that came to life and strangled people. A cliffhanger to one episode which showed a police officer being revealed to actually be an Auton in disguise was also heavily criticised. But something else that's notable about this story is a scene in which a Time Lord appears to tell the Doctor that the Master is now on Earth. In this scene, this Time Lord is depicted as being a sort of older uh, and upper class type, literally having a cane and top hat. It's possible that he may have just been trying to be conspicuous with the time, though given the fact that he's hovering hundreds of metres up in the air probably doesn't help that. He's shown as being a much more normal and human character, if you will, which considering that the Time Lords have been introduced only 18 months before in the War Games, and in this they have been depicted as these almost godlike beings with, with an omniscient society. This depiction of the Time Lords would continue throughout the Let's era, with them being shown as being bureaucratic button pushers in Colony in Space and the Three Doctors. Holmes's next contribution to the show was Season 10's Carnival of Monsters. This story included the Doctor and Joe finding themselves on a ship where everything seems to be happening in a loop, before discovering that they're actually in a micro-sized zoo, which is currently sitting in some sort of terminal. Again, this story does have some of the political agenda that Robert Holmes had in his scripts, with the bureaucratic aliens shown in the story. Very good. You have your attitude. No, 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 merely a relative, I'm confident. But he will be disposed of. Absolutely. But also, it did have a sort of anti-zoo message in it, arguing that it was immoral for these creatures to be kept in this device. This again was a pretty solid story and is considered to be one of the best of the Pertwee era and again showed how great a writer Robert Holmes could be. His next script would be The Time Warrior for series 11, the story which introduced both Sarah Jane Smith and another recurring alien in The Centaurans, which were better written here than they would be ever again. This story is again much darker being set in medieval times with the Centauran coming to the future to kidnap scientists to fix his machine for him and started to show sort of the gothic writing style that Holmes would start to introduce to the show. Barry Letts commented saying that he often had to tone down Holmes' scripts and with the Time Warrior he had to take out a line in which a character says that he will drink the blood from the skulls oh, God, of his enemies. God, I swear I'll chop him up so fine not even a sparrow will fill its beak at one peck. Despite Holmes' scripts having to be toned down a bit, he was then made the script editor for the series taking over from Terence Dix, starting at the beginning of the fourth Doctor's era. This also coincided with Barry Letts leaving and being replaced by producer Philip Hinchcliffe. The combination of writer Robert Holmes, producer Philip Hinchcliffe and actors Tom Baker would go on to create one of the greatest eras in Classic Who, which is considered by many to be one of the golden eras of Doctor Who. With Holmes's much more violent and adult writing style, along with Hinchcliffe's intention to make the show much more like a hammer horror type, the show would become much darker and gorier and violent over this period. The first story to have Robert Holmes's credit to it during this period was The Ark in Space. This was originally written by John Lucarotti, but extensive rewrites were needed, and given that he was living in Corsica at the time, Lucarotti wasn't available for these rewrites. Robert Holmes extensively rewrote this story, so much so that his credit was then put on it. And The Ark in Space is, well, another great story. It is considered to be one of the greatest of Doctor Who, and people have pointed out similarities between this story and the 1979 Ridley Scott film Alien, leading many to believe that it's possible that the award-winning film could have actually been ripped off from this Doctor Who story. Suffice to say, The Ark in Space is a great story and deserves to be so. It's unclear how much of it was actually Holmes' own work, but this was a very good story and certainly both Holmes and Lucarotti deserve recognition for this amazing script. Also in season 12 came another story. During Barry Letts' time on the show, he was approached several times by Terry Nation with the script, which would have shown the origins of the Daleks, something which Letts figured would be too important to be let down by a poor story. 
and he felt that the script wouldn't be able to properly show the origins of the Daleks and could only undermine them. Robert Holmes, however, took this script and edited it a lot. It's unclear how much was Holmes' work, but given the track record of Nation's scripts around the time, it's clear that Holmes did have a big influence in this story. This story would then go on to be Genesis of the Daleks. It is by far one of the greatest stories in Doctor Who history and Doctor Who magazine in 1997 did find it to be the greatest story of all time and it is deservedly so of this position. The origins of the Daleks, as Let said, was important to nail just right and that is what this story does. It showed how civilization could be brought so close to destruction that it creates the Daleks. There are Terry Nation tropes throughout the story, such as the back and forth chases and the giant clan monster, and the Nazi imagery would have likely been in Nation's original script, but Holmes likely lent further on this and added a lot to the violence and the death in this story and the gore in the creation of the Dalek mutants. Whilst this story is credited to Terry Nation, it, it must also be considered that Robert Holmes did have a big influence in this story, even if he's not credited as such. His next contribution to the show was Pyramids of Mars, which is another amazing story. He was just hitting out home runs all the time by this point. Pyramids of Mars lent very strongly on the Hammer Horror aspect. It is noticeable that Pyramids of Mars took a lot of influence from 1936's The Mummy and 1957's Harahoma film The Mummy with a lot of Egyptology and it is again a much more gory and violent story with characters being shot and crushed to death and sort of a mixture between being strangled and burned. I'm not exactly sure what this death is. But the villain of Sutek in this story, a being with the power of a god but is trapped to a single chair on Mars, only able to influence events with the power of his mind, it is such a brilliant villain. And this story really is one of the greats. His next credit of sorts to the show is kind of in the brain of Morbius. This story was originally written by Terence Dix, but extensive rewrites were needed, mostly due to budget reasons, such as the character of Solomon not being a robot, but instead just a regular human. Terence Dix wasn't exactly happy with these changes, and asked for his name not to be credited on it. When asked what to credit it as, Dix suggested using a pseudonym and having it be something bland. As such, this story was then literally credited to Robin Bland. The Brain of Morbius, again, really, really goes well into the hammer horror aspects, literally being in a mad scientist's lab, creating a Frankenstein-like monster. With this witch-like cult just down the road, it, well, really went full into the violence and gore in the show. And it's also notable for introducing the Morbius Doctors during a mind battle between the Doctor and Morbius. We see the Doctor's previous regenerations going back to before Hartnell. And these Doctors were producers and writers for the show dressed up in costumes and wigs, one of which was Robert Holmes himself. It, these incarnations of the Doctor were just sort of forgotten about. It, that was up until the series 12 finale, The Timeless Child, where, spoilers, the Morbius Doctors were then re-canonised. The Brain of Morbius, again, is an example of a great script. And again, it's not exactly clear how much was Terence Dix and how much was Robert Holmes. So again, they must both be commended for this story. Holmes's next credit for the show would be The Deadly Assassin. Holmes commented that it was difficult to write this story on account of it not having a companion for the Doctor to talk to. This is the only story outside of the 2009 specials not to have a companion alongside the Doctor. This was the first time a story was entirely set on Gallifrey since, well, the War Games episode 10. And because of that, it introduced us to a lot of the Time Lord society. Robert Holmes revisited his interpretation of the Time Lords as being bureaucratic button pushers and really went full out with that in this story, with the Time Lords being much older and the Lord President of Gallifrey appearing to be almost senile. This, of course, is another political commentary for the time, supposing to be like our own MPs and Lords. This story is also very influential in the future of the show. It introduced us to 
Time Lord Society, as well as the Matrix and the Crispy Master. And why is the Master Crispy? Well, it's because of the 12 regeneration limit, something which was introduced in this very story. The original intention was that with the eight Morbius Doctors, this would make Tom Baker the 12th Doctor and thereby the final regeneration. Hinchcliffe and Holmes were intending to do a story in which we find out how the Doctor gets past this regeneration limit, but unfortunately things started to go south. The fan base absolutely hated this story, the way that Time Lords were depicted and the addition of the 12th regeneration limit. When I remember watching the Brendan Morbius and just going, what? I was disappointed when they revealed later that that wasn't, I, I hated the fact that it clearly said uh, that the Doctor could only regenerate 12 times. I had subtracted from me all the joy of imagining those other Doctors yeah, yeah, yeah. by this bloody rule. Since then, these aspects of the Time Lords and Doctor Who mythology have become a basic part of the show's lore. And with that acceptance, the Deadly Assassin is now appreciated as being another great story which took a lot of inspiration from the Manchurian Candidate, even if there are still some fans that aren't happy with the depiction of Time Lords. However, Mary Whitehouse, who was a social activist and self-appointed speaker of the people, had been long campaigning against violence and gore in children's television and had taken issue particularly with Doctor Who at the time, arguing that it should be taken off the air because kids shouldn't be exposed to such stuff. With the cliffhanger to episode 3 of The Deadly Assassin, which ends with a freeze frame showing the Doctor being held underwater, this was considered too horrific for tea time television, and with the loss of the fan base as well, the BBC finally gave in to Mary Whitehouse's demands. This led to Philip Hinchcliffe being taken off as producer of the show and Holmes taken off as script editor, though they still had one ace up their sleeve. The finale of season 13, The Talons of Wing Chiang, is yet another brilliant story from the typewriter of Robert Holmes. Russell T Davis would say that The Talons of Wing Chiang had the best dialogue ever written. It is another witty story and introduced us to Jager and Lightfoot, two characters which despite only appearing in this one serial, would be given a complete spin-off series by Big Finish 40 years down the road. This story was based on Robert Banks Stewart's original script for this slot, The Foe from the Future, and did reuse some of the elements from the story, most notably having a disfigured villain who wears a mask, much like the Phantom of the Opera. This story, however, was set in 1800s London and really, really brought out the hammer horror aspects of the show. The writing of this story was superb and extremely witty and really goes into the gothic horror that this era had been aiming for. However, taking aspects from the genre of hammer horror and 1800s literature such as Sherlock Holmes, with the Doctor literally dressing up as Sherlock Holmes, this story does have some problematic issues. There's a giant rat in it that just looks absolutely awful. I mean, years later, Stephen Moffat would say that he has absolutely no idea what they were thinking of with this rat because no one in their right mind would have thought that the BBC would be able to pull off such an effect with the budget that they were working on. Though that isn't actually the problematic issue that you're probably thinking of. The genres that this story takes off from do have an unfortunate view on foreign cultures. And in this story, they lent a lot on Chinese culture. The depiction of the Chinese characters in this story is nowadays not exactly looked back on very well. It's problematic to say the least, and though it is just a product of its time essentially, though it is exemplified even more by the character of Li Sang Chang being portrayed in yellow face. This is, this is a topic that I'm not going to delve too far into because it's literally a joke amongst Doctor Who fandom that as soon as anyone mentions the racism in the talents of Wang Chiang, the conversation's just going to be derailed, and I don't want this video to be all about that. So that unfortunately takes away from what a brilliant story this is. A poll in 2003 by Gallifrey One actually found the talents of Wang Chiang to be the number one story of all time. Holmes then ended his tenure as script editor for the show midway through season 15, with his last edited serial being The Image of the Fendal. As well as writing many great stories throughout his run in the show, he also script edited for many other great stories through this era. Terror of the Zygons, The Seeds of Doom, The Robots of Death, The Horror of Fang Rock. All of these stories did have Robert Holmes contribute in some way to their story, and so these stories should also be bared in mind when you're thinking about the legacy that he left behind. Now that he was no longer script editor for the show, Robert Holmes didn't end writing stories for it. 
For season 15, immediately after he ended his tenure as script editor, he contributed a story called The Sunmakers, which is one of the most overtly political stories in Doctor Who history. I mean, it's literally called The Sunmakers. If you don't know what that means, look at the flag of China. Who wrote The Sunmakers as a skit on the inland revenue with a gatherer, a collector and a corridor P45? Robert Holmes, correct. Which the story depicts a class divide on the planet Pluto, which has developed due to overtaxation, with a richer upper class that taxes the lower class for every single penny they've got. The story literally opens with a man attempting to commit suicide because he's unable to pay his taxes. The Doctor sparks a revolution in the story, literally by quoting Karl Marx at people, and then it turns out that the villain behind it all was actually an alien squid in disguise. This was a commentary on the very high tax rates that the Labour government were imposing at the time. Holmes's next contribution to the show would be the season 16 opener, The Rebus Operation. This story is a decent story, but it's not up to the same standard as Robert Holmes's previous stories. This story is basically a B after a straight run of A's and A stars. It's a decent story, and Robert Holmes was given the responsibility of introducing the new companion, Romana. And yes, that does mean that at this point, he had been in some way involved in writing stories that introduced five companions in a row. It also introduced the Black and White Guardians and the Key to Time, which would become key to the overall story throughout this season. The Rebus Operation itself is basically a high story, and is a solid serial, but again is nothing particularly spectacular. However, Holmes's second contribution to the season would be the power of Kroll. He was asked to include the biggest monster Doctor Who has ever seen in it, which of course on the budget and effects they had at the time wasn't going to end well, and the writing and acting and production values in the story are all just failing. Holmes included the Swampies as natives which are being enslaved by this uh, companies come into mind for natural resources, which again, political commentary, but the story just is completely not to the same standard of anything else that he had written before. It's widely regarded as being one of the worst stories in the Tom Baker era, and at this point it was basically clear that Robert Holmes had reached burnout with his writing on Doctor Who. At this point he more or less had stopped writing for the show, in part due to new producer John Nathan Turner wanting to have more newer writers rather than just using older writers. Holmes would go on to write for other shows such as Into the Labyrinth and Blake Seven. He was however then later asked to write his idea of the Six Doctors for the 20th anniversary special. However, progress on the script was so slow that they eventually gave in and decided to use Terence Dix's The Five Doctors instead. However, Robert Holmes was asked if he would come back to write Peter Davison's Swan Song the following year, and, well, he did. As Robert Holmes saw it, Peter Davison's Doctor had got off easy during his run on the show, and wanted to, quote, put the Doctor through hell. So Robert Holmes, trying to put the Doctor, quote, through hell, mixed with script editor Eric, Resurrection of the Daleks has a death count of more than 70 Sayward, would lead to, well, one of the bloodiest stories in Doctor Who history. The Caves of Androzani, the Doctor and Perry basically find themselves stepping in toxic bat poo, and the only cure is the bat's milk. This is complicated by the fact that they find themselves in the middle of a war zone between a madman who has an army of androids and the government military, as well as a group of hired mercenaries. This story was basically the Doctor and Perry find themselves in hell and everyone dies. Literally, the only character in this story not to die is Perry. This story is, again, an absolute masterpiece. This story was extremely violent and depicts the Doctor being tortured and Perry being sexually harassed. It has another a mutilated masked character and, well, everyone dies. This story is very widely praised. In fact, in the Doctor Who magazine Mighty 200 poll of 2009, the Caves of Androzani was voted the best Doctor Who story of all time. It is a brilliant story and easily the best of Peter Davison's era, well, could argue it could be Earthshock, well, 
Earthshock and the Five Doctors are up on the same level, but no, Keys of Androzani is one of the best Doctor Who stories of all time, with its amazing direction by new director to Doctor Who, Graham Harper, who would later be asked back to direct many episodes for the new series during David Tennant's run more than 20 years later. Holmes was then asked back again to write for the show in season 22 with the sixth Doctor, but was requested to also include the second Doctor and Jamie in this story, as well as have Holmes's original villains of the Santarans return. The Two Doctors is a 3 by 45 minute story, and well, it's good. It's nothing spectacular, but it is a decent story. Holmes originally intended for it to be set in New Orleans, but due to budget problems it was changed to Spain, something which annoyed Holmes a lot because a lot of references to it being set in New Orleans had to be taken out of the script. Patrick Troughton and Fraser Hines are on top form in this story, as well as Colin Baker and Nicola Bryant, and it is a decent story, though the Centaurians are really underused. The two Doctors did also have a message in it, as Robert Holmes was a vegetarian. It has a species of the Angrigums which are butchers and meat-obsessed and were supposed to put children off eating meat, essentially. This story did gather complaints of excessive violence, in particular one scene in which a character is stabbed to death in a restaurant, which some said was just shock violence. So having written two stories for the show and gained lots of complaints for violence, one thing was clear. Robert Holmes was back. He was then asked to write a story for season 23. This story would have featured the Autons, another alien race that Holmes had introduced, and would have been set in Singapore and also featured either the Master or the Rani. And this story was to be called Yellow Fever and How to Cure It. Unfortunately, Michael Grade happened and season 23 was cancelled. The other stories of this season, The Nightmare Fair, Mission to Magnus and The Ultimate Foe, were then adapted into Target novelizations, and all the other stories that would have been in this season were later adapted into Big Finish audios. Given how little had been made of this story, literally the title Singapore Autons and either the Master or the Rani is all that's known about it, well we'll never know what this story could have been or what would have happened in it. After the 18 month hiatus Doctor Who was brought back for a 14 episode serial, it was decided that as the fate of Doctor Who was unsure, this season would comprise of a single 14 part story which would be made up of four stories within it. Robert Holmes was asked to write the first and last episodes of this season and oversee the general story of the trial. After writing the opening four episodes, subtitled The Mysterious Planet, Robert Holmes wasn't happy with comments that Jonathan Powell made about the serial, saying that it was too comedic. In fact, the comments made in the memo were so strong that they rattled then script editor Eric Sayward as well, and may have contributed towards his later resignation. This four-part story that essentially opened the trial of the Time Lord it wasn't exactly the greatest. It did have a bit too much slapstick in it, and the production values just weren't there, mainly due to the budget cuts. The Mysterious Planet was back down to the Crotons level, where it's passable, but there's nothing really spectacular about it, and was frankly interchangeable with anything else. Robert Holmes was also responsible for writing the two episodes to end the series on The Ultimate Foe. He was in the middle of writing episode 13 when he was struck by a short illness which unfortunately killed him. Script editor at the time Eric Sayward agreed to finish off these two episodes writing episode 13. However, a disagreement between him and producer John Nathan Turner led to Eric Sayward resigning as script editor for the show. This led to producer John Nathan Turner having to ask Pip and Jane Baker, the writers of the third segment, The Terror of the Vervoids, to finish off episode 14 based on the notes that Robert Holmes had left. This led more or less to a botched ending and sort of botched the series overall. With The Mysterious Planet and The Ultimate Foe not exactly being the greatest, this led to Robert Holmes' final contribution to the show to be a bit of a downer. However, despite ending the show more or less on a sour note, Robert Holmes' legacy and contribution to the show was still immense. He had written for the show for 18 years and had contributed to some of its greatest stories. As I said, The Talents of Wing Chiang and The Caves of Androzani have both been voted to be the best story in Doctor Who history.
Robert Holmes may have stuttered to begin with, putting out stories like the Crotons and the Space Pirates, which weren't exactly great. But through the 70s and into the 80s, he produced such great stories. Spearhead from Space, Carnival of Monsters, Ark in Space, Pyramids of Mars, The Deadly Assassin, The Caves of Androzani. He made so many great stories that he was very much one of the people behind the second wave of Doctor Who popularity through the 70s. And his amazing writing to be able to bring out the gore and the horror and the violence and the scare factor that made Doctor Who become synonymous with hiding behind the sofa and his witty dialogue and his amazing characters introducing so many companions to the show he, it really showed just how brilliant of a writer he was and as a writer was one of the greatest assets that Doctor Who ever managed to get its hands on Decades after his death, Russell T Davis would say that Robert Holmes was one of the greatest writers of British television, and the fact that it's unlikely he'll be remembered, mostly due to him writing genre stuff, is a real tragedy. But Robert Holmes himself said in the 70s that if Doctor Who was cancelled tomorrow, 50 years on, people would still look back and say, do you remember that show and remember what it was that they had written? And the fact that we're now 40 years on from when he said that, and Doctor Who is still on the air and still takes influence from what he wrote just shows how much of a great legacy he left behind and he is fully deserving of the title of one of Doctor Who's greatest ever writers.